Choice Home Care and Hospice present Choices to Benefit the Aging with your host, Joe Yurutia. Welcome to Choices to Benefit the Aging. I'm Joe Rutia, Community Senior Service Coordinator for Choice Hospice and Home Health. Welcome to our program today. Our topic of, for this uh, week is um, the 2000 National Healthcare Decision um, Day events, which is being held um, by uh, UMC, University Medical uh, Hospital, and the, through the El Paso County Attorney's Office. And our guest today is Joanne. Berna, um, the El Paso County Attorney. Welcome to our program, Joanne. Thank you, Joe. Thank you for having me. Uh, Joanne, what is the purpose of the 2012 National Healthcare Decision Day? Okay. National Healthcare Decision Day is a national event which is designed to bring attention to a person's ability to make healthcare decisions for themselves and to encourage the community to start a dialogue and a conversation about end-of-life decisions. So National Healthcare Decision Day, as it's called, really goes to trying to stress to an individual that you have the right to make healthcare decisions for your own body and for your own future. So as part of National Healthcare Decisions Day, my office, the county attorney's office, in conjunction with the University Medical Center, provides free what are called living wills for people. Um, and a living will, if I might explain, Please. is actually a legal and binding document. This is a document in which a person can tell healthcare professionals precisely what they would like happen to them, what kind of medical treatment they would like if they were unable to make those decisions. And so there's two different scenarios. Um, for example, and the, the most obvious kind of case is a case called the Terry Schiavo case. Mm -hmm. Many of your viewers may have heard about Terry Schiavo. Oh, if not, can you give us a, an explanation of sure. that case? She was a young woman that lived in Florida who suffered a traumatic brain injury. And what ensued or what followed was a large, a long, protracted legal battle between the husband of Terry Schiavo and the parents of Terry Schiavo. The doctors had declared that Ms. Schiavo um, would never um, be able to use her brain function again, would never be able to live without artificial means of sustaining her. And so her husband wanted her disconnected from the life support. That's mm -hmm. what we commonly call it, life support. She would be on life support the rest of her life. Her parents, however, were adamant that they wanted their daughter kept on life support. So that case um, ultimately you know, traveled through the courts for many, many years while Ms. Schiavo remained on life support until a judge stepped in and made the decision on whether or not she could be taken off life support. So um, for your viewers, what a living will would have done for Ms. Schiavo, it's a simple document that you fill out and if she had filled it out, she could have decided if she wanted to remain on uh, life support, if she wanted to be kept alive by artificial means, or if she wanted those artificial means disconnected and under what circumstances. Now, for many people in the community, particularly the elderly, um, these are issues that are of concern to them. And I've spoken to um, many people you know, in my job, especially the elderly, who have very strong feelings that they want their wishes regarding life support, regarding artificial means to be carried out. And so what I want to stress is that there is no right or wrong answer. Um, for religious reasons, for personal reasons, for many reasons, um, a person may want to be kept on life support uh, indefinitely. And for many other reasons, a person may not. Uh, the purpose of this Healthcare Decisions Day is not to convince anybody that there's a right way or a wrong way. The purpose of our trying to offer this free service to the community is so that a person, an individual, makes that decision themselves and doesn't have others make that decision for them. Um, do you find that being a Latino community here in El Paso, and, and I come from a hospice um, um, background, and I see this on a daily basis, meeting with families and patients that uh, the subject has never been broached. And I mostly right. see it among the Latino community that they do not want to talk about end of life. 
end of life uh, issues, issues are very difficult. And, and even to broach the subject uh, upon giving the education of hospice, the, even the word hospice has a bad um, uh, connotation to them. You know, it's bad news, uh, not knowing right. that it's, a, it's we're there to support them in this journey. And now when you start broaching these type of subjects, um, I guess, do you find that in the Latino community, it's something that is not one to be touched on, and why? Right. I, I think you're right. I think that it is a very, I think end-of-life discussions are always difficult, regardless of, of your community or your culture. But in my experience, and I don't mean to generalize, but in my experience, the Latino um, culture or community fosters a feeling of taking care of your own, and especially your elderly, at any cost. So there is a feeling or a sentiment I've gotten from, from some that, um, for example, I had someone tell me, I don't care how sick my mother is, I would want her on life support and I would want to keep her on life support until the day that God took her because she's my mother and I will go see her every day. Well, the question isn't what you know that son might want. The question is what does the mother want? And if that's what the mother wants, then she has the right to make those decisions. But we instill a culture of caring, which is a good thing. Mm -hmm. um, not all <laughs> end of life decisions are made um, because of a lack of care. In many ways, um, making these decisions now when you are uh, healthy, uh, healthy enough to make these decisions, in my opinion, is one of the most loving and caring things that you can do for your family. Um, if you, if you uh, become incapacitated, and, and it, medically it happens generally in two ways. It could be a situation where you are diagnosed with a terminal illness, and the doctors tell you that um, you will not recover from this illness, mm -hmm. and you have less than six months to live, and you're making end-of-life decisions because you know the end of your life is coming. Uh, that's one way in which this might come up. A different way might be um, a situation where you are a healthy 50-year-old and you're driving to work and uh, you're in a terrible car accident and can't make medical decisions. And so who will step in to make those medical decisions? So they can be end-of-life decisions on your medical care, but they can also be um, medical questions that need to be answered. And so there is a law in Texas that provides that if you are unable to make your own medical decisions, there is a, um, a list of who will make them for you. If you have a spouse and you're unable to decide, your spouse can legally decide for you um, to you know, end of life issues as well as medical decisions. Mm -hmm. If you don't have a spouse or your spouse has uh, predeceased you, um, then it's your children. Now, of course, the, the, the problem is in our culture in particular, you uh, run across families that have many children. And getting a, a group of children to decide on such a critical issue during the most emotional time in that family's life um, is near to impossible. I mean, how hard it is to get that group to decide on where to go to lunch. Having to decide on end of life issues where the parent has not told the children, this is what I want, can make for a hugely stressful time for the family, uh, more stressful, of course, than it already is. You know, John, uh, I meet with families on a daily basis uh, when the physician orders for hospice, and I usually have a family one-on-one. -on -one. And with our Latino culture here, we're, it's a family, are eight to 10 children, and to sit with them and, and uh, um, and explain the programs to them and explain to them about a do not resuscitate form or a living will. It's, um, it's very challenging and it, it, at a critical moment that you're talking to them, um, they're grieving and they're, they're confused. Uh, a lot of issues from their childhood t tend to surface and, and, and it just exacerbates. So things that happened in the past in your childhood right. is now playing in, 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 in this right. whole scheme of issues that they're going through. And it's very difficult for them. And versus where I see a family that has, uh, in, as a matter of fact, just today, um, sitting with a, a, a lady and uh, to discuss about her mother that was okay. going to be placed on hospice. And she had an advanced directive. She had a living will. And it was just a, a very um, pleasant um, uh, to sit with her and go over, look, this is about the program. She goes, look, mom already knows what she wanted. And we are going to respect, um, you know, she right. has Alzheimer's. 
and we're going to respect that. Okay. This is about her dignity. So for you to do something like this, I'm, I'm, I'm glad that um, you're having this event. Um, my question to you is, is this the first time you've had this event, or is this going to be ongoing? You know, I think this is probably our sixth year now. It might, and it might be okay. longer, but I know that we have done this for several years. Um, started under my predecessor, now Senator Rodriguez, um, and we have uh, provided living wills both at our annual, uh, when we celebrate National Healthcare Decisions Day, but also as part of our community outreach. For okay. example, we had, um, there was a senior love conference last month. And uh, so we provide lawyers at different community events that can be available with the forms to explain. Now, obviously, we're, we're uh, uh, prosecutors, we're public lawyers, so we can't provide private legal advice. But we can walk a person through the form and give them general legal advice. And the forms in Texas are really quite simple. Uh, I think it's helpful to have a lawyer explain to you the terms if you have questions, but they are something that a person can execute without the need to use the money to hire a lawyer. We also have the forms on our website so that a person can uh, log on to our website and download the forms. What is that website, Joanne? Our website is, uh, the county website is epcounty.com. And if you just click on the county attorney button, that will take you to our website. And uh, I believe it's under the National Healthcare Decisions uh, button. button. And you can download those documents. Joanne, because you're very proficient in the, uh, uh, the, 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 what is it, the last will and testament and uh, the living will or advanced directives, please um, give us more information about right. these two. Okay, and I'm glad you asked because it's important for me to emphasize that there is a huge difference between a last will and testament and what we call living wills. Uh, a last will and testament is your will. That's a will that you should go to a lawyer for. It's who you want to leave your house to. It's who you want to uh, leave your property, your um, financial decisions come under a last will and testament. That's not what this is about. Okay. What we are talking about today are what are called living wills. Okay. They're also legally called advanced directives. Um, they're also called medical power of attorney. And they are different ways of saying, and I'm glad you used the word dignity earlier, because to me that's what it's about. It is, uh, these are legal ways recognized under Texas law that allows a person to make end of life decisions or medical decisions right now while they're healthy and competent to make those decisions um, and have those decisions on how they wanna be treated what their medical decisions are. So they relate only to medical decisions and end of life decisions. That's what the living wills are. Uh, it's while you're living, you tell what you want to happen when you're not in a position to make those decisions. Joanne, once a person fills out a li the living will, or again, which is the advanced directive, um, is it already engraved in stone that, okay, this is already set in stone and it's, you know, it needs to be, um, go by what I have written on this piece of paper and signed off? Yes. I mean, it's very, very difficult to challenge it. Okay. I mean, there, there could be very limited circumstances where um, maybe a person would try to prove that they weren't competent to sign that. But that's actually quite rare. I mean, you know, my experience has been, and like I said, we've done this for several years, is that it is a real relief to a family. Uh, it's a difficult decision, but I think my, my experience has been that for adult children, mm -hmm. they would much rather know. It, it is, a, like I said, it's a loving thing to do, to take that decision away from your spouse or your children or if you're you know, an adult, a young person, where your parents would make that decision. It's a loving thing for them to do because there is a, a natural part association of guilt in these decisions. And so um, I, you know, I can speak from my personal experience with my mother and, and having, obviously, I've had this conversation with her and she is adamant that she does not want to be kept on artificial life support, that she would like to be kept comfortable with whatever medication. She doesn't want to be in pain. But those, these are things that she's communicated to me and she's written it down. She has um, communicated it to my other siblings. And so uh, she's, you know, thank God, perfectly, uh, healthy and we're not in a situation where we have to deal with this but I've had that serious conversation with her and so if it were to come up I would know what her wishes were when she was a healthy 
uh, competent adult and able to make those decisions. And it is the most respectful thing you can do because you're in a position where you're not able to say uh, what you want. And all around you, people are deciding, you know, what kind of uh, transfusions or, you know, tubes mm -hmm. or life support or, um, you know, maybe uh, being kept alive by only because they're feeding you and you have no brain function. You know, those are the kinds of those are the kinds of decisions where you need to have the conversation when you're well enough to have the conversation. You know, um, last night I was having a conversation with a very good friend of mine. Prior to that, we had discussed, uh, and I'm going to go outside of the living will and the advanced directives. Um, she wanted to know, I don't know where I want to take my husband, if I'm going to bury him here or take him to, you know, where I'm going to, where I, we never, we right. never wanted to discuss that. And it was so difficult for her and I kind of felt the pain for her because she's seen him sick and now she's having to make this decision right. now and it's just, it, it's a burden now on her that she says, I don't know what to do. And says, well, let's pray and let's see what, you know, God, right. uh, um, you know, he will right. put us in that, put you in that direction. The interesting thing is that last night she told me, you know, there was a conversation that uh, another friend of his came by to visit him and he himself said, this is where I want to go. I don't want to be here in El Paso. And she was just so relieved by right. him saying that. that. She goes, God, her. it's just like I saw this right. burden off of her. And really, when you have all these little, your little, all your little ducks right. lined up and, you know, it just whatever you're going through that moment, if um, it's I think you can have a, a peaceful death. And I so can so your too. family share it and not deal with all this right. uh, decisions that you have to make at end of life right. and at that moment. And I, I think it, it particularly complicates grief after a person passes if the children are not um, in agreement on what the the person would have wanted. And so it's that complicated, you know, uh, unable to just mourn and celebrate the life of someone if if there are some of the siblings feeling like, you know, their mother wouldn't have wanted that, their mother uh, would have wanted life support or not wanted life support. So it, it's something that can stay with. Um, children for many, many years. I want to discuss about the advanced directive. Who can prepare um, an advanced directive and how old do you have to be? You have to be 18 years old okay. and anyone can prepare it. That's why we have them on our website. Um, you can prepare them yourself. There are uh, directions mm -hmm. that are contained on the website that give you a little bit of information. If you would like assistance, I would remind your viewers that on Friday the 13th, and I'll make sure that I get the dates right, okay. on Friday the 13th from 9.30 to 6 o'clock, okay. we will have uh, a kickoff event, and that's where we will have the forms there. We will have lawyers from my office Great. together with UMC staff available uh, to fill out these living wills so that if a person wants to fill out one out, you go to UMC, meet us in the lobby on April 13th, starting at 9.30, okay. and we will help you fill it out. Uh, we will have witnesses available because it needs to be signed by two witnesses. We'll have witnesses available that can witness the document for you. So when you leave, you will have your living will completely filled out. And then, of course, uh, we'll also have a clinic on Saturday, April 14th from 10 to 6, also at UMC. Okay, again, so the kickoff event is Friday, April 13th. Right. And you said 9.30 a.m.? 9.30 to 6. 9.30 to 6. And this is at the UMC lobby, at University Medical Lobby. And uh, what was the other? I'm sorry. So that's the second one is second Saturday, one, Saturday, April 14th. Yes, ma'am. From 10 to 6. And that's at Bassett Center. Is that correct? Yes. I've been corrected. I said UMC. I was wrong. Saturday, it's Bassett Center. Joanne, what um, you, should you tell your loved ones uh, about the care you do or do not want uh, how can you broach the subject with your family? What would, is your advice? Right. You know, that's, that's a difficult one, and I think it depends on the family dynamics. Um, what I have seen work that is very successful is to bring it up in a situation where you're not sick. You know, like mm -hmm. you described with your friend. It's much harder when you're in a real-life situation where someone is ill. But when you're healthy, you know, for, for myself, for example, I have an advanced directive. I don't think you're ever too young or too old to have one. I have an advanced directive. I've told my husband, I know I'm not sick, and that's why I want you to know right now. These are my wishes. Mm -hmm. Here it is written down. Uh, you may disagree with me at the time, but I'm a grown woman, and this is what I want, and I don't want you to be making these decisions. You know, you're going to be miserable enough without me. So... Um, so it's during a time when there's not the stress in your life, 
then you um, fill out your advance directive. Our recommendation, I mean, you know, they, they are living wills, but they don't have to be filed legally anywhere. So we suggest that you uh, make your original that should be placed wherever you keep your important papers, where you keep your um, you know, life insurance documents mm -hmm. or the deed to your house or whatever are your most important papers. Put a copy of your living will there. And do you advise also to inform a family, a couple of families, give copies? Can you Absolutely. make copies? Is sure, that allowable? Sure, you can make copies uh, can give to, to give to every sibling in okay. the family. So there's no question that during this time period. And uh, I, I also suggest always that there's everyone has that one friend that if something happens, who would they call? Maybe it's a tia, maybe it's a best friend or a comadre, somebody. So that that person will step up and say, nope. You know, I talked to her. This is what she wanted. Because what you want is as many people understanding your decision. Mm -hmm. And, of course, we always advise that if you have a longtime family doctor, that you give it to your family doctor. Because if you're ill, That's your family doctor may be called uh, to the hospital or called by your family. And so your family doctor would say, I have in her medical records or his medical records his wishes already regarding his medical treatment. Joanne, do the forms need to be notarized or... Um be prepared by an attorney? They do not need to be prepared okay, by an attorney. That's a question that's constantly right. asked. That's why we have them on, our, uh, on the internet. People they shy can, away because right. of that. And they <laughs> think they have to pay a lot of money. Yes. They can download them on the internet okay. and they can fill them out themselves. They do have to be notarized okay. by two people. They have to be witnessed. Sorry, they don't have to be notarized. They have to be witnessed by two people, which means that you have to have two people that witness you signing it. Um, we recommend, and the law requires, that it not be someone that you're related to by blood or marriage. Okay. So a neighbor, okay. uh, you could take it um, you know, to your pastor, someone who has in involved. And as long as two people have signed that they witness you signing this document, uh, that's all you need. And it does not have to be notarized. It's um, in interesting that we're having this conversation, work that my, working as uh, educator with hospice and end of life. Um, I always say, you know, I like to get patients during the end, not at the end, because during the end, we're able to process right. all this wa paperwork. And during a six month period that uh, it's allowable, you know, um, hospice can last for two years right. as long as the patient continues. But I always like to able be able to admit a patient during uh, that process, uh, that they can make the decisions, the families can make the decisions, so, and then it just makes it much easier versus the patient that I get at the end, you know, they have one week or two weeks and we're trying to make all these decisions and it's just right. a very um, emotionally taxing for the family, for right. the staff, and I think this conference, I'm, uh, I'm glad that you're having this because it's, for me and for all the other hospices in the community, it makes it much easier this I type hope of, so. of, of education that I you're providing so. out there. Um, have you found more participants or interest of uh, more of the baby boomers? Are they participating or the the seniors out there? Or are right. you finding children going to these conferences? You know, I, I think the the interest that we have found most comes from our senior citizens, frankly. Um, very often they will see, they have lived through um, the passing of a spouse or some other family member. And so I think with age comes the wisdom and experience of having lived through end of life decisions of other people. Very often you find with young people, they think uh, it'll never happen to me, I have a long time. But so, Joanne, I would really would like to see more of, uh, I'm hoping that I would see a um, younger generation going out there and participating and looking at this type of information out there. I think it's very it's important. important uh, you, to you educate yourself. Right, you never know. And, and I think the beauty of doing your living will is that you do it, you put it with your important documents, and then you don't think about it anymore. It isn't something that you need to worry about and something uh, just sign with you, like doing your uh, last will and testament. Do it, get it over with, you save your family, time and heartache after your passing, and then you just concentrate on and on life. I'm going to just share another experience. Uh, just this week, I, one of my childhood friends passed away over the, I'm the sorry weekend. To hear that. Young guy, uh, same age, and um, I remember trying to talk about this, and he himself at that point said, No, I don't know much about it. I don't want to talk about this right now. Right. My goal is to fight this and right. beat this, the cancer, and, um, and um, anyways, he, he was trying to fight it, but I remember trying to talk to him about this, um, right. this type of forms out there. Um, 
Can you identify any culture or language barriers within the Hispanic community um, that prevent them from right. the, uh, considering the advanced directive? Right. I, I do think that there are, um, that there are issues, like we talked a little earlier, uh, culturally, um, that are very difficult to talk about end-of-life issues. When someone is sick and you begin to discuss end-of-life issues, there is a feeling that you've given up on them or you've given up hope or you're being discouraging instead of supportive and encouraging. And so I think there is a natural uh, hesitancy. And as I mentioned earlier, the fact that um, culturally we uh, tend to, to uh, I, I guess I, I want to express it, that we live in a, in a culture that embraces and enhances um, taking care of your elderly uh, as long as possible and so and having them in the home and so where that's a great and beautiful aspect of our culture mm -hmm. it doesn't mean that these decisions shouldn't be addressed because they will face everyone at some point or another blood transfusions what can you tell me about that in advanced directives? Right. Um, in advanced directives, and like I said, there's two forms. The advanced directives, and mm -hmm. during those decisions when, those, those times when you're unable to make medical decisions, and then there's a medical power of attorney. Mm -hmm. And the medical power of attorney, you can lay out precisely what medical decisions, um, that you're not expected to die, uh, right? This is a situation where maybe you're having um, a serious surgery. Uh, for religious re re reasons, there are many people that do not want blood transfusions. Mm -hmm. And as an adult, you have the right to decide that you don't want those transfusions. And so your decisions that you make regarding your body and your medical decisions should be yours and should be made uh, awesome. not when you're in the hospital in critical condition, but um, with thought and with dignity and with the advice and consultation of your doctor, perhaps. I mean, you take this form you know, to your doctor and tell them, this is what I want, um, and have that discussion. Joanne, just because we're running out of time, and, and I never thought about the um, blood transfusions, and I'm glad you, uh, we discussed this. And the other one is, since we're really running, what are the consequences of not having a living will? Right. The consequences are um, if you are in a, in a position where you can't make medical decisions, um, that unfortunately that decision will be left to the people closest to you and probably the people most distraught. And so having a living will will alleviate them of that burden and that guilt of making very difficult decisions and at the same time gives an adult the power and the dignity to make those end of life decisions um, at a critical time. Awesome. Again, they can go to your website. Please give us a EP website. epcounty.com EP and County. go to the county attorney website or you can join us April 13th at University Medical Center from 9.30 to 6, or Saturday, April 14th from 10 to 6 at Bassett Center. Joanne Bernal, honestly, this has just been an awesome. Oh, I great. enjoyed this, com um, this interview today, and uh, it's something that really comes close to heart to me. And I want to invite the public out there, please go to this conference. It's a very important uh, information out there that you have attorneys and healthcare providers that can uh, help you right. with this. Uh, it's uh, and no, the more you know, the more you empower yourself. That's correct. Again, I want to thank the public today um, for watching us, uh, watching us today on Choices to Benefit the aging and uh, please look for your Southwest Senior magazine uh, for weekly topics on Southwest Senior. If you have any questions regarding the hospice Medicare benefit you may call me Joe Rutia at Choice Home Health and Hospice at 544-0044 or Robert Vasquez for the home care benefit. Thank you again for watching us today on Choices to Benefit the Aging. God bless you. Choices to Benefit the Aging has been brought to you by Choice Home Care and Hospice. For more information on this program, go to El Paso Southwest Senior Magazine at www.southwestsenior.com. Furniture provided by Copenhagen, 6550 North Mesa.